Don't just read NCERT. Listen it and feel it. Physics, textbook of class twelfth, part one, chapter four, moving charges and magnetism, narrated by Isnarafat Khan. Introduction. Both electricity and magnetism have been known for more than two thousand years. However, it was only about two hundred years ago. in 1820 that it was raised that they were intimately related during a lecture demonstration in summer of 1820 a danish physicist hans christian oersted noticed that a current in a straight wire caused a noticeable deflection in a nearby magnetic compass needle he investigated this phenomena he found that the alignment of the needle is tangential to an imaginary circle which has a straight wire as its center and has its plane perpendicular to the wire this situation is depicted in figure 4.1a it is noticeable when the current is large and the needle sufficiently close to the wire so that the earth's magnetic field may be ignored reversing the direction of the current reverses the orientation of the needle the deflection increases on increasing the current or bringing the needle closer to the wire iron fillings sprinkled around the wire arrange themselves in concentric circles with the wire as the center or state concluded that moving charges or current produces a magnetic field in the surrounding space Following this there was intense experimentation in 1864 the laws obeyed by electricity and magnetism were unified and formulated by James Maxwell who then realized that light was electromagnetic waves radio waves were discovered by Hertz and produced by JC Bose and G Marconi by the end of the 19th century A remarkable scientific and technological progress has taken place in 20th century. This is due to our increased understanding of electromagnetism and the invention of devices for production, amplification, transmission and detection of electromagnetic waves. In this chapter we will see how magnetic field exerts forces on a moving charged particle like electrons protons and current carrying wires we shall also learn how current produces magnetic fields we shall see how particles can be accelerated to a very high energy in a cyclotron we shall study how currents and voltage are detected by a galvanometer in this chapter and the subsequent chapter on magnetism we adopt the following convention a current or a field electric or magnetic emerging out of the plane of the paper is depicted by a dot and the current or a field going into the plane of a paper is depicted by a cross magnetic fields sources and fields before we introduce the concept of magnetic field b we shall recapitulate what we have learned in chapter 1 about the electric field e we have seen that the interaction between two charges can be considered in two stages the charge q the source of field produces an electric field e where e is equals to q by 4 pi epsilon not into r square into r unit vector where r is the unit vector along r and e is a vector field a charge q interacts with this field and experiences a force f given by f is equals to q e is equals to small q into capital q by 4 pi epsilon not into r square into r unit vector as pointed out in the chapter 1 the electric field e is not just an artifact but has a physical role it can convey energy and momentum and is not established instantaneously but takes finite time to propagate a concept of field was especially stressed by faraday and was incorporated by maxwell in his unification of electricity and magnetism 
in addition to depending on each point in space it can also vary with time that is be a function of time in our discussions in this chapter we will assume that the fields do not change with time the field at a particular point can be due to one or more charges if there are more charges the field add vectorly you have already learned in chapter 1 that this is called the principle of superposition once the field is known the force on a test charge is given by equation 4.2 just as static charges produce electric field the current or moving charge produces in addition a magnetic field denoted by br again a vector field it has several basic properties identical to electric field it is defined at each point in space and can in addition depend on time experimentally it is found to obey the principle of superposition the magnetic field of several sources is the vector addition of magnetic field of each individual source magnetic field lorentz force Let us suppose that there is a point charge Q moving with a velocity v and located at r at a given time t in presence of both electric field ER and the magnetic field BR the force on an electric charge Q due to both of them can be written as F is equals to F electric plus F magnetic is equals to Q into ER plus V into BR This force was first given by H A Lorentz based on the extensive experiments of Ampere and others. It is called the Lorentz force. You have already studied in detail the force due to electric field. If we look at the interaction with magnetic field, we find the following features. 1. It depends on Q, V and B, charge of the particle, velocity and the magnetic field. force on a negative charge is opposite to that on a positive charge 2 the magnetic force q into v cross b includes a vector product of velocity and magnetic field the vector product makes a force due to magnetic field vanish become zero if the velocity and magnetic field are parallel or anti parallel The force acts in a sideways direction perpendicular to both velocity and magnetic field. Its direction is given by the screw rule or the right hand rule for vector or cross product as illustrated in figure 4.2. 3. The magnetic force is zero if charge is not moving. Only a moving charge feels the magnetic force. The expression for the magnetic force helps us to define the unit of the magnetic field if one takes q f and v all to be unity in the force equation f is equals to q into v cross b is equals to q v b sin theta unit vector n where theta is the angle between v and b the magnitude of a magnetic field b is 1 si unit when the force acting on unit charge 1 coulomb moving perpendicular to the b with a speed 1 meter per second is 1 newton dimensionally we have b is equals to f by qv and the unit of b are newton second per coulomb meter this unit is called tesla named after nikola tesla tesla is a rather large unit a smaller unit non si called the gauss is equals to 10 to the power minus 4 tesla is also often used the earth's magnetic field is about 3.6 into 10 to the power minus 5 tesla table 4.1 lists magnetic fields over a wide range in the universe magnetic force on a current carrying conductor we can extend the analysis of force due to the magnetic fields on a single moving charge to a straight rod carrying current consider a rod of uniform cross sectional area a and length l we shall assume one kind of mobile carriers as in a conductor here electrons let the number density of these mobile charge carriers in it be n 
then the total number of mobile charge carriers in it is NAL. For a steady current I, in this conducting rod, we may assume that each mobile carrier has an average drift velocity Vd. In the presence of external magnetic field B, the force on these carriers is F is equals to NAL QVD into B, where Q is the value of the charge on the carrier. Now NQVD is the current density J and NQVD A is the current I. See chapter 3 for the discussion of current and the current density. Thus, F is equals to NQEVD AL into B is equals to JAL cross B is equals to IL into B, where L is the vector of magnitude L, the length of rod, and with a direction identical to the current. Note that the current I is not a vector. In the last step leading to equation 4.4, we have transferred the vector sign from J to L. Equation 4.4 holds for a straight rod. In this equation, B is the external magnetic field. It is not the field produced by the current carrying rod. If the wire has an arbitrary shape, we can calculate the Lorentz force on it by considering it as a collection of linear strips DLJ and summing F is equals to sum of I DLJ cross B. This summation can be converted into integral in most cases. Permittivity and Permeability In the universal law of gravitation, we say that any two point masses exert a force on each other which is proportional to the product of masses m1 and m2 and inversely proportional to the square of the distance r between them. We write it as F is equals to G M1 into M2 by R square, where G is the universal constant of gravitation. Similarly, in Coulomb's law of electrostatics, we write the force between the two point charges Q1, Q2 separated by a distance R as F is equals to K Q1, Q2 by R2, where K is a constant of proportionality. In SI units, K is taken as 1 by 4 pi epsilon, where epsilon is the permittivity of the medium. Also in magnetism, we get another constant, which in SI units is taken as mu by 4 pi, where mu is the permeability of the medium. Although G, epsilon and mu arise as a proportionality constant, there is a difference between gravitational force and electromagnetic force. While the gravitational force does not depend on the intervening medium, the electromagnetic force depends on the medium between the two charges or magnets. Hence, while G is a universal constant, epsilon and mu depends on the medium. They have different values for different media. The product epsilon mu turns out to be related to the speed of V of electromagnetic radiation in the medium through epsilon mu is equals to 1 by v square. Trick permeativity Epsilon is a physical quantity that describes how an electric field affects and is affected by a medium. It is determined by the ability of a material to polarize in response to an applied field and thereby to cancel partially the field inside the material. Similarly, magnetic permeability mu is the ability of a substance to acquire magnetization in magnetic fields. It is a measure of the extent to which the magnetic field can penetrate matter. Motion in a magnetic field We will now consider in a great detail the motion of a charge moving in a magnetic field. We have learned in mechanics that a force on a particle does work if the force has a component along or opposite to the direction of motion of particle. In the case of motion of a charge in a magnetic field, the magnetic force is perpendicular to the velocity of the particle. So no work is done and no change in the magnitude of velocity is produced. So, the direction of the momentum may be changed. Notice that this is unlike the force due to an electric field QE. 
which can have a component parallel or anti parallel to the motion and thus can transfer energy in addition to momentum we shall consider motion of a charged particle in a uniform magnetic field first consider the case of v perpendicular to b the perpendicular force q v cross b acts as a centripetal force and produces a circular motion perpendicular to magnetic field the particle will describe a circle if v and b are perpendicular to each other if velocity has a component along b this component remains unchanged as the motion along the magnetic field will not be affected by the magnetic field the motion in a plane perpendicular to b is as before a circular one thereby producing a helical motion you have already learned in earlier classes that if r is the radius of circular path of a circle then a force of mv square by r acts perpendicular to the path towards the center of the circle and is called the centripetal force if the velocity v is perpendicular to the magnetic field b the magnetic force is perpendicular to both v and b and acts like a centripetal force it has a magnitude qvb equating the two expressions of centripetal force mv square by r is equals to qvb which gives r is equals to mv by qb for the radius of the circle described by a charged particle the larger the momentum the larger is the radius and bigger the circle described if omega is the angular frequency then v is equals to omega r so omega is equals to 2 pi nu is equals to qb by m which is independent of the velocity or energy where nu is the frequency of rotation the independence of nu from energy has important application in the design of cyclotron the time taken for one revolution is t is equals to 2 pi by omega is equals to 1 by mu if there is a component of velocity parallel to the magnetic field it will make the particle move along the field and the path of the particle would be helical one the distance moved along the magnetic field in one rotation is called pitch p using equation we have p is equals to v parallel into t is equals to 2 pi m v parallel by qb the radius of the circular component of motion is called the radius of helix helical motion of charged particle and aurora borealis In polar regions like Alaska and North Canada, the splendid display of colors is seen in the sky. The appearance of dancing green-pink light is fascinating and equally puzzling. An explanation of this natural phenomena is now found in physics in terms of what we have studied here. Consider a charged particle of mass m and charge q. entering a region of magnetic field b with an initial velocity v let this velocity have a component vp parallel to the magnetic field and a component vn normal to it there is no force on a charged particle in the direction of field hence the particle continues to travel with the velocity vp parallel to the field the normal component vn of the particle result in a lorentz force vn cross b which is perpendicular to both vn and b as seen in section 4.31 the particle thus has a tendency to perform a circular motion in a plane perpendicular to the magnetic field a helix along the magnetic field line as shown in figure a here Even if the field line bends the helically moving particle is trapped and guided to move around the field line since the lorentz force is normal to the velocity of each point the field does not work on the particle and magnitude of velocity remains the same during a solar flare a large number of electrons and protons are ejected from sun 
Some of them get trapped in the Earth's magnetic field and moves in helical path along the field lines. The field lines come closer to each other near the magnetic poles. See figure B. Hence the density of charges increase near poles. These particles collide with atoms and molecules of the atmosphere. Excited oxygen atoms emit green light and excited nitrogen atoms emit pink light. This phenomena is known as aurora borealis in physics. Motion in a combined electric and magnetic fields. Velocity selector. You know that a charge Q moving with velocity v in presence of both electric and magnetic field experiences a force given by F is equals to Fe plus Fb. We shall consider a simple case in which electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular to each other and also perpendicular to the velocity of particle. Therefore, F is equals to Q E minus Vb into j unit vector. Thus, the electric and magnetic forces are in opposite directions as shown in the figure. Suppose we adjust the value of E and B such that the magnitude of the two forces are equal. Then total force on the charge is zero and the charge will move in the fields undeflected. This happens when QE is equal to QVB and V is equal to E by B. This condition can be used to select the charged particle of a particular velocity out of a beam containing charges moving with different speeds irrespective of their charge and mass. The crossed E and B fields, therefore, serve as a velocity selector. Only particles with the speed E by B pass undeflected through the region of crossed fields. This method was employed by J.J. Thomson in 1897 to measure the charge to mass ratio E by M of an electron. The principle is also employed in mass spectrometer, a device that separates charged particles, usually ions, according to their charge to mass ratio. Cyclotron The cyclotron is a machine to accelerate charged particles or ions to high energies. It was invented by E. O. Lawrence and M. S. Livingston in 1934 to investigate nuclear structure. The cyclotron uses both electric and magnetic fields in combination to increase the energy of charged particles. As the fields are perpendicular to each other, they are called cross fields. Cyclotron uses the fact that the frequency of revolution of charged particle in a magnetic field is independent of its energy. The particles move most of the time inside two semicircular disks like metal containers D1 and D2, which are called Ds as they look like the letter D. Figure 4.8 shows the schematic view of the cyclotron. Inside the metal box, the particle is shielded and not acted on by the electric field. The magnetic field, however, acts on the particle and makes it go round in a circular path inside a D. Every time the particle moves from one D to another, it is acted upon by the electric field. The sign of the electric field is changed alternately in tune with the circular motion of the particle. This ensures that the particle is always accelerated by the electric field. Each time the acceleration increases the energy of the particle, as energy increases the radius of the circular path increases. So the path is a spiral one. The whole assembly of evacuated to minimize collisions between the ions and the air molecules. A high frequency alternating voltage is applied to the Ds. In the sketch shown in figure 4.8, positive ions or positively charged particles are released at the center P. They move in a semicircular path in one of the Ds and arrive in the gap between the Ds in a time interval T by 2, where T is the period of revolution, is given by equation 4.6. T is equals to 1 by nu C is equals to 2 pi M by QB or nu C is equals to QB by 2 pi M.
This frequency is called the cyclotron frequency for obvious reasons and is denoted by nu c. The frequency nu a of the applied voltage is adjusted so that the polarity of the d's is reversed in the same time that it makes the ions to complete one half of the revolution. The requirement v a is equals to v c is called the resonance condition. The phase of the supply is adjusted so that when the positive ions arrive at the edges of D1, D2 is at the lower potential and the ions are accelerated across the gap. Inside the Ds, the particle travel in a region free of electric field. The increase in their kinetic energy, QV, each time they cross from one D to another. V refers to the voltage across the Ds at that time. From equation 4.5, it is clear that the radius of their path goes on increasing each time their kinetic energy increases. The ions are repeatedly accelerated across the Ds until they have the required energy to have a radius approximately that of the Ds. They are then deflected by a magnetic field and leave the system via an exit slit. From equation 4.5, we have V is equals to QBR by M, where R is the radius of trajectory at exit and equals the radius of the D. Hence, the kinetic energy of the ions is half mv square is equals to Q square B square R square by 2m. The operation of the cyclotron is based on the fact that the time for one revolution of an ion is independent of its speed of radius of its orbit. The cyclotron is used to bombard nuclei with energetic particles so accelerated by it and study the resulting nuclear reactions. It is also used to implant ions into solids and modify their properties or even synthesize new materials. It is used in hospitals to produce radioactive substances which can be used in diagnosis and treatment. Accelerators in India India has been a clearly entrant in the area of accelerator-based research. The vision of Dr. Meghnath Saha created 37-inch cyclotron in the Saha Institute of the Nuclear Physics in Kolkata in 1953. This was soon followed by a series of Cockroft Walton type of accelerator established in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research TIFR, Mumbai, Aligarh Muslim University, Aligarh, Bose Institute, Calcutta and Andhra University, Voltaire. The 60s saw the commissioning number of a Van de Graaff generator accelerators, a 5.5 megavolt terminal machine in Bhaba Atomic Research, BARC, Mumbai, 1963, a 2 megavolt terminal machine in Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, a 400 kV terminal machine in Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi, and Punjab University, Patiala. One 66 cm cyclotron donated by Rostra University of USA was commissioned in Punjab University, Chandigarh. A small electron accelerator was also established in University of Pune in a major initiative. Taken in 70s and 80s, a variable energy electron was built indigenously in a variable energy cyclotron center VECC Kolkata. 2 megavolt tandem Van de Graaff accelerator was developed and built in BARC and a 14 megavolt tandem pelletron accelerator was installed in TIFR. This was soon followed by a 15 megavolt tandem pelletron established by University Grants Commission UGC as an inter university facility in the Inter University Accelerator Center in New Delhi. A 3 megavolt tandem pelletron in Institute of Physics Bhubaneswar and 1.7 megavolt tandetron in Atomic Mineral Directorate of Exploration and Research Hyderabad and Indira Gandhi Center of Atomic Research, Kalpakkam. 
both DIFR and IUAC are augmenting their facilities with the addition of superconducting LINAC modules to accelerate the ions to higher energies. Besides these ion accelerators, the Department of Atomic Energy DAE has developed many electron accelerators. A 2 GeV synchrotron radiation source is being built in Raja Ramanana Center for Advanced Technologies Indore. The Department of Atomic Energy is considered Accelerator Driven System ATS, for power production and fissile material breeding as future options. Magnetic Field Due to Current Element Biot Severed Law all the magnetic fields that we know are due to the currents or moving charges and due to the intrinsic magnetic moments of particles. Here we shall study the relation between currents and magnetic field it produces. It is given by Biot Severed Law. Figure 4.9 shows a finite conductor XY carrying a current I. Considering an infinitesimal element DL of the conductor, magnetic field DB due to this element is to be determined at a point P which is at a distance R from it. Let theta be the angle between DL and the displacement vector R. According to the Biot Severed law, the magnitude of the magnetic Field dB is proportional to the current I, the element length dL and is inversely proportional to the square of the distance R. Its direction is perpendicular to the plane containing dL and R. Thus in vector notation, dB is directly proportional to I dL cross R divided by R cube is equals to mu naught by 4 pi into i dl cross r by r cube where mu naught by 4 pi is a constant of proportionality the above expression holds when the medium is vacuum the magnitude of this field is db is equals to mu naught by 4 pi into i dl sin theta by r square where we have used the property of cross product Equation 4.11a constitute our basic equation for magnetic field. The proportionality constant in SI units has the exact value. Mu naught by 4 pi is equals to 10 to the power minus 7 tesla meter by ampere. We call mu naught the permeability of the free space or vacuum. The Biot Severed law for the magnetic field has the certain similarities as well as differences with the Coulomb's law for the electrostatic field. Some of these are 1. Both are long range since both depend inversely on the square of distance from the source to the point of interest. The principle of superposition applies to both fields. In this connection, note that the magnetic field is linear in the source I dL, just as the electrostatic field is linear in its source, the electric charge. 2. The electrostatic field is produced by a scalar source, namely the electric charge. The magnetic field is produced by a vector source I dL. 3. The electrostatic field is along the displacement vector joining the source and field point. The magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane containing the displacement vector R and the current element I dL. Fourth, there is an angle dependence in the Biot Severed law which is not present in the electrostatic case. In figure 4.9, the magnetic field at any point in the direction of dl, the dashed line is 0. Along this line, theta is equals to 0, sin theta is equals to 0. From equation 4.11a, db is equals to 0. There is an interesting relation between epsilon naught, the permeativity of the free space, mu naught, the permeability of the free space, and c, the speed of light in vacuum. Epsilon naught mu naught is equals to 1 by 3 into 10 to the power 8 whole square is equals to 1 by c square. We will discuss this connection further in detail in chapter 8 on the electromagnetic waves. 
since the speed of light in vacuum is constant the product mu not epsilon not is fixed in magnitude choosing the value of either epsilon not or mu not fixes the value of the other in si units mu not is fixed to be equal to 4 pi into 10 to the power minus 7 in magnitude in the next section, we shall use the biot severt law to calculate the magnetic field due to a circular loop. Magnetic field on the axis of a circular current loop. In this section, we shall evaluate the magnetic field due to a circular coil along its axis. The evaluation entails summing up the effect of infinitesimal current elements I D L mentioned in the previous section. We assume that the current I is steady and that the evaluation is carried out in the free space that is vacuum. Figure 4.11 depicts a circular loop carrying a steady current I. The loop is placed in the YZ plane with its center at the origin O and has the radius R. The x-axis is the axis of loop. We wish to calculate the magnetic field at point P on this axis. Let x be the distance of P from the center O of the loop. Consider a conducting element DL of the loop. This is shown in figure 4.11. The magnitude dB of the magnetic field due to dL is given by the biot severt law. dB is equals to mu naught by 4 pi into I dL cross R by R cube. Now R square is equals to X square plus R square. Further, any element of the loop will be perpendicular to the displacement vector from the element to the axial point. For example, the element dL in figure 4.11 is in the yz plane where the displacement vector r from dL to the axial point P is in the xy plane. Hence, dL cross r is equals to r dL. Thus, dB is equals to mu naught by 4 pi into i dl by x square plus r square the direction of db as shown in the figure 4.11 it is perpendicular to the plane formed by dl and r it has an x component dbx and a component perpendicular to x axis db perpendicular when the components perpendicular to the x-axis are summed over, they cancel out and we obtain a null result. For example, the dB perpendicular component due to dL is cancelled by the contribution due to the diametrically opposite dL element, shown in figure 4.11. Thus, only the x component survives. The net contribution along x direction can be obtained by integrating dBx is equals to dB cos theta over the loop. A summation of elements dL over the loop yields 2 pi r, the circumference of the loop. Thus, the magnetic field at P due to the entire circular loop is B is equals to bx i vector is equals to mu naught i r square by 2 x square plus r square to the power 3 by 2 into i unit vector as a special case of the above result we may obtain the field at the center of the loop here x is equals to 0 and we obtain b naught is equals to mu naught i by 2 r into i unit vector the magnetic field lines due to a circular wire form closed loops and are shown in figure 4.12. The direction of the magnetic field is given by another right-handed thumb rule stated below. Curl the palm of your right hand around the circular wire with the fingers pointing in the direction of current. The right-hand thumb gives the direction of magnetic field. Ampere circuit law there is an alternative and appealing way in which the biot severed law may be expressed. Ampere circuital law considers an open surface with a boundary. The surface has current passing through it. We consider the boundary to be made up of a number of small line elements. 
consider one such element of length dl we take the value of the tangential component of magnetic field bt add this element and multiply it by the length of that element dl all such products are added together we consider the limits as the length of elements get smaller and their number gets larger the sum then tends to an integral ampere's law state that this integral is equal to mu times the total current passing through the surface that is loop integral b dot dl is equals to mu not i where i is the total current through the surface the integral is taken over the closed loop coinciding with the boundary c of the surface the relation above involves a sign convention given by right-handed rule let the fingers of the right hand be curled in the sense the boundary is traversed in the loop integral b dot dl then the direction of thumb gives the sense in which the current i is regarded as positive for several applications a much simplified version of equation proves sufficient we shall assume that in such cases it is possible to choose the loop called as amperian loop such that at each point of the loop either b is tangential to the loop and a non-zero constant b or b is normal to the loop or b vanishes now let l be the length part of the loop for which b is tangential let ie be the current enclosed by the loop then the equation reduces to bl is equals to mu naught ie when there is a system with a symmetry such as for a straight infinite current carrying wire in figure 4.15 the ampere's law enables an easy evaluation of magnetic field much the same way gauss law help in determination of electric field this is exhibited in example 4.8 below the boundary of the loop chosen is a circle and magnetic field is tangential to the circumference of the circle. The law gives for the left hand side of equation 4.17b, we find that magnetic field at a distance r outside the wire is tangential and is given by b cross 2 pi r is equals to mu naught i. b is equals to mu naught i by 2 pi r. The above results for the infinite wire is interesting from several points of view. 1. It implies that the field at every point on a circle of radius r with a wire along the axis is same in magnitude. In other words, the magnetic field possesses what is called the cylindrical symmetry. The field that normally can depend on three coordinates depend only on one, r. Whenever there is symmetry, the solutions simplify. 2. The field directions at any point on this circle is tangential to it. Thus, the lines of constant magnitude of the magnetic field form concentric circles. Those lines, called the magnetic field lines, form closed loops. This is unlike the electrostatic field lines, which originate from positive charges and end at negative charges. The expression for the magnetic field of a straight wire provides a theoretical justification to Oersted experiment. 3. Another interesting point to note is that, even though the wire is infinite, the field due to it at a non-zero distance is not infinite. It tends to blow up only when we come very close to the wire. The field is directly proportional to the current and inversely proportional to the distance from the long current source. Fourth, there exists a simple rule to determine the direction of the magnetic field due to a long wire. This rule, called the right hand rule, is grasp the wire in your right hand with your extended thumb pointing in the direction of the current. Your finger will curl around the direction of the magnetic field. Ampere circuital law is not new in content from biot severed law. Both relate the magnetic field and the current, and both expresses the same physical consequences as steady electric current. Ampere circuital law 
is to biotsevert law what gauss law is to coulomb's law both amperes and the gauss law relate the physical quantity on the periphery or boundary magnetic field and the electric field to another physical quantity namely the source in the interior current or charge we also note that ampere circuit law holds for steady currents which do not fluctuate with time it should be noted that while ampere circuit law holds for any loop it may not always facilitate an evolution of the magnetic field in every case for example for the case of a circular loop as discussed in section 4.6 it cannot be applied to extract the simple expression b is equals to mu not i by 2r for the field at the center of the loop however there exists a large number of situations of high symmetry where the law can be conveniently applied we shall use it in the next section to calculate the magnetic field produced by two commonly used and very useful magnetic systems the solenoid and the toroid the solenoid and the toroid the solenoid and the toroid are the two pieces of equipments which generate magnetic fields the televisions use solenoid to generate magnetic fields needed the synchrotron uses a combination of both to generate high magnetic fields required in both solenoid and toroid we come across a situation of high symmetry where ampere law can be conveniently applied the solenoid we shall discuss a long solenoid by long solenoid we mean that the solenoid's length is large compared to its radius it consists of a long wire wound in the form of a helix where the neighboring turns are closed space so each turn can be regarded as a circular loop the net magnetic field is the vector sum of the field due to all the turns Enameled wires are used for winding so that turns are insulated from each other. Figure 4.17 displays the magnetic field lines for a finite solenoid. We show a section of this solenoid in an enlarged manner in figure 4.17a. In this figure it is clear from the circular loops that the field between two neighboring turns vanishes. In figure 4.17b we see the field at interior midpoint P is uniform is strong and along the axis of the solenoid the field at the exterior midpoint Q is weak and moreover is along the axis of the solenoid with no perpendicular or normal component as the solenoid is made longer it appears like a long cylindrical metal sheet Figure 4.18 represents this idealized picture. The field outside the solenoid approaches zero. We shall assume that the field outside is zero. The field inside becomes everywhere parallel to the axis. Consider a rectangular Amperian loop ABCD. Along CD, the field is zero as argued above. Along transverse sections BC and AD, the field component is zero. Thus these two sections make no contribution. Let the field along AB be B. Thus the relevant length of the Amperian loop is L is equals to H. Let N be the number of turns per unit length, then the total number of turns is NH. The enclosed current is IE is equals to INH, where I is the current in the solenoid. From ampere circuit law BL is equals to mu not IE BH is equals to mu not I NH B is equals to mu not NI The direction of the field is given by right hand rule the solenoid is commonly used to obtain a uniform magnetic field we shall see in the next chapter that a large field is possible by inserting a soft iron core outside the solenoid the toroid the toroid is a hollow circular ring on which a large number of turns of a wire are closely wound. It can be viewed as a solenoid which has been bent into a circular shape to close on itself. It is shown in figure 4.19a carrying a current I. We shall see that the magnetic field in an open space inside the point P and exterior to the toroid point Q is zero. The field B inside the toroid is constant in magnitude for the ideal toroid of closely wound turns. 
Figure 4.19b shows a sectional view of the toroid in the direction of the magnetic field inside is clockwise as per the right hand thumb rule for the circular loops. Three circular American loops 1, 2, 3 are shown by the dashed lines by symmetry. The magnetic field should be tangential to each of them and constant in magnitude for a given loop. The circular areas bound by loop 2 and 3 both cut the toroid so that each turn of the current carrying wire is cut once by the loop 2 and twice by the loop 3. Let the magnetic field along loop 1 be B1 in magnitude. Then in Ampere circuital law, equation 4.17a, L is equals to 2 pi R1. However, the loop encloses no current, so IE is equals to 0. Thus, B1 into 2 pi R1 is equals to mu naught 0. B1 is equals to 0. Thus, the magnetic field at any point P in the open space inside the toroid is 0. We shall now show that the magnetic field at Q is likewise 0. Let the magnetic field along loop 3 be B3. Once again, from Ampere's law, L is equals to 2 pi R3. However, from the sectional cut, we see that the current coming out of the plane of the paper is cancelled exactly by the current going into it. Thus, IC is equals to 0 and B3 is equals to 0. Let the magnetic field inside the solenoid be B. We shall now consider the magnetic field at S. Once again, we employ Ampere's law in the form of equation 4.17a. We find L is equals to 2 pi r. The current enclosed IC is for n turns of toroidal coil Ni. B 2 pi r is equals to mu naught Ni. B is equals to mu naught Ni by 2 pi r. We shall now compare the two results for a toroid and solenoid. We re-express the equation 4.21. To make the comparison easier with the solenoid result given in equation 4.20. Let R be the average radius of the toroid and N be the number of turns per unit length. Then N is equals to 2 pi R N is equals to average parameter of the toroid into number of turns per unit length and thus B is equals to mu naught N I. That is the result for the solenoid. In an ideal toroid, the coils are circular. In reality, the turns of the toroidal coil from a helix and there is always a small magnetic field external to the toroid. Force between two parallel currents and ampere. We have learned that there exists a magnetic field due to a conductor carrying a current which obeys the biot severed law. Further, we have learned that an external magnetic field will exert a force on a current carrying conductor. This follows from the Lorentz force formula. Thus, it is logical to expect that the two current carrying conductors placed near each other will exert magnetic forces on each other. In the period 1820 to 25, Ampere studied the nature of this magnetic force and its dependence on the magnitude of the current, on the shape and size of the conductors as well as the distances between the conductors. In this section, we shall take the simple example of two parallel currents carrying conductors which will perhaps help us to understand and appreciate the Ampere's painstaking work. Figure 4.20 shows two long parallel conductors A and B separated by a distance D and carrying parallel currents IA and IB respectively. The conductor A produces the same magnetic field BA at all points along the conductor B. The right hand rule tells us that the direction of this field is downwards when the conductors are placed horizontally. Its magnitude is given by equation 4.19a or from the Ampere circuital law BA is equals to mu naught IA divided by 2 pi D. The conductor B carrying a current IB will experience a sideways force due to the field BA. The direction of this force is towards the conductor A. We label this force as FBA, the force on segment L of B due to A. 
The magnitude of this force is given by equation 4.4. FBA is equals to IB, LBA is equals to mu naught IA into IB divided by 2 pi D into L. This is of course possible to compute the force on A due to B. From the length L of A due to the current in B, it is equal in magnitude to FBA and directed towards B. Thus, FBA is equals to minus FAB. Note that this is consistent with the Newton's third law. Thus, at least for the parallel conductors and steady currents, we have shown that the biot severt law and the Lorentz force yields results in accordance with the Newton's third law. We have seen from above that the current flowing in the same direction attract each other. One can show that oppositely directed currents repel each other. Thus, parallel current attracts and anti-parallel current repels. This rule is opposite to what we find in electrostatics. Like or the same sign charge repel each other but the unlike attract each other. But here like or parallel currents attract each other. Let FBA represent the magnitude of force FBA per unit length. Then from equation 4.23, FBA is equals to mu naught IA into IB divided by 2 pi D. The above expression is used to define the ampere, which is one of the 7 SI base unit. The ampere is the value of this steady current which when maintained in each of the two very long straight parallel conductors of negligible cross section and placed one meter apart in vacuum would produce on each of these conductors a force equal to 2 into 10 to the power minus 7 newtons per meter of length. This definition of the ampere was adopted in 1946. This is a theoretical definition. In practice, one must eliminate the effect of the Earth's magnetic field and substitute very long wires by multi-turn coils of appropriate geometries. An instrument called the current balance is used to measure this mechanical force. The SI unit of the charge, namely the coulomb, can now be defined in the terms of ampere. When a steady current of 1 ampere is set up in a conductor, the quantity of the charge that flows through its cross-section in 1 second is 1 coulomb. Torque on current loop magnetic dipole Torque on a rectangular current loop in a uniform magnetic field. We now show that rectangular loop carrying a steady current I and placed in a uniform magnetic field experiences a torque. It does not experience a net force. This behavior is analogous to that of the electric dipole in a uniform electric field. We first consider the simple case when the rectangular loop is placed such that the uniform magnetic field B is in the plane of loop. This is illustrated in the figure. The field exerts no force in the two arms AD and BC of the loop. It is perpendicular to the arm AB of the loop and exerts a force F1 on it which is directed into the plane of loop and its magnitude is F1 is equals to I small b into capital B. Similarly, it exerts a force F2 on the arm CD and F2 is directed out of the plane of the paper. F2 is equals to I into small b into capital B is equals to F1. Thus, the net force on the loop is zero. There is a torque on the loop due to the pair of force F1 and F2. Tau is equals to F1 into A by 2 plus F2 into A by 2 is equals to IAB where A is equals to the AB is the area of the rectangle. We consider next the case when the plane of loop is not along the magnetic field but makes an angle with it. We take the angle between the field and the normal to the coil to be the angle theta. The previous case corresponds to theta is equals to pi by 2. The force on the arms BC and DA are equal and opposite and acts along the axis of the coil which connects the centers of the masses of BC and DA. Being collinear along the axis, they cancel each other, resulting in no net force or torque. 
द फोर्स ऑन आर्म ए बी एंड सी डी आर एफ वन एंड एफ टू दे टू आर इक्वल एंड ऑपोजिट विद मैग्नीट्यूड एफ वन इज इक्वल्स टू एफ टू इज इक्वल्स टू आई इन टू स्मॉल बी इन टू कैपिटल बी बट दे आर नॉन कोलिनियर दिस रिजल्ट इन अ कपल एज बिफोर The torque is however less than the earlier case when the plane of loop was along the magnetic field this is because the perpendicular distance between the force of the couple has decreased figure 4.22b is a view of the arrangement of ad and it illustrates these two forces constituting a couple here tau is equals to iab sin theta as theta approaches to zero the perpendicular distance between the forces of the couple also approaches to zero this makes the force collinear and the net force and the torque zero the torques in these two equations can be expressed as vector product of the magnetic moment of the current loop as m is equals to ia where the direction of the area vector a is given by right hand thumb rule and is directed into the plane of paper in figure 4.21 thus the angle between m and b is theta equation 4.26 and 4.27 can be expressed by one expression tau is equals to m cross b this is analogous to the electrostatic case As is clear from equation 4.28 the dimensions of the magnetic moment are al square and its unit is am square from equation we see that the torque vanishes when m is either parallel or anti parallel to the magnetic field b this indicates a state of equilibrium as there is no torque on the coil this also applies to any object with magnetic moment m when m and b are parallel equilibrium is a stable one any small rotation of the coil produces a torque which brings it back to the original position when they are anti parallel the equilibrium is unstable as any rotation produces a torque which increases with the amount of rotation the presence of this torque is also the reason why a small magnet or any magnetic dipole aligns itself with the external magnetic field If the loop has n closely wound turns the expressions of the torque equation 4.29 still holds with m is equals to nia circular current loop as a magnetic dipole in this section we shall consider the elementary magnetic element the current loop we shall show that the magnetic field at large distances due to current in a circular current loop is very similar in behavior to the electric field of an electric dipole in section 4.6 we have evaluated the magnetic field on the axis of a circular loop of radius r carrying a steady current i the magnitude of field is b is equals to mu not i r square divided by 2x square plus r square whole to the power 3 by 2 as its direction is along the x axis and is given by right hand thumb rule here x is the distance along the axis from the center of the loop for x much much greater than r we may drop the r square term in the denominator thus b is equals to mu not i a divided by 2 pi x cube as earlier we define the magnetic moment m to have a magnitude ia m is equals to ia hence b is equals to mu not m divided by 2 pi x cube the expression of this equation is very similar to an expression obtained earlier for an electric field of a dipole the similarity may be seen if we substitute mu with 1 by epsilon not and m by p and b by e then we obtain e is equals to 2p divided by 4 pi epsilon not x cube which is precisely the field of an electric dipole at a point on its axis considered in chapter 1 it can be shown that the above analogy can be carried further we had found in chapter 1 that the electric field on the perpendicular bisector of the dipole is given by E is equals to P E by 4 pi epsilon not x cube, where x is the distance from the dipole. 
the results given in the equation 4.3a and 4.3b becomes exact for a point magnetic dipole. The results obtained above can be shown to apply to any planar loop. A planar current loop is equivalent to a magnetic dipole of the dipole moment m is equals to ia, which is the analog of the electric dipole moment b. Note, however, a fundamental difference. An electric dipole is built up of two elementary units, the charge or the electric monopoles. In magnetism, a magnetic dipole or a current loop is mostly the elementary element. The equivalent of the electric charges, that is the magnetic monopoles, are not known to exist. We have shown that a current loop 1 produces the magnetic field and behaves like a magnetic dipole at large distances and 2 is subject to torque like the magnetic needle. And this led Ampere to suggest that all the magnetism is due to the circulating currents. This seems to be partly true and no magnetic monopoles have been seen so far. However, elementary particles such as the electron or a proton also carry an intrinsic magnetic moment not accounted by the circulating currents. The magnetic dipole moment of a revolving electron. In chapter 12, we shall read about the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom. You may perhaps have read this model which was proposed by the Danish physicist Niels Bohr in 1911 and was a stepping stone towards a new kind of mechanics namely the quantum mechanics. In the Bohr's model, the electron, a negatively charged particle, revolves around a positively charged particle that is the nucleus, much as the planet revolves around the sun. The force in the former case is electrostatic that is the Coulomb's force, while it is gravitational for the planet-sun case. This shows that Bohr picture of the electron in figure 4.23. The electron of charge E performs the uniform circular motion around a stationary heavy nucleus of charge plus ZE. This constitutes the current I, where I is equals to E by T, and T is the time period of revolution. Let R be the orbital radius of the electron and V be the orbital speed, then T is equals to 2 pi R by V. Substituting the equation, we have I is equals to Ev by 2 pi r. There will be a magnetic moment, usually denoted by mu, associated with this circulating current. The equation 4.28, its magnitude is mu is equals to I pi r square is equals to Ev r by 2. The direction of this magnetic moment is into the plane of the paper in figure 4.23. This follows from the right-handed rule discussed earlier and the effect that negatively charged electron is moving anti-clockwise leading to the clockwise current. Multiplying and dividing the right-hand side of the above expression by the electron mass m, we have mu is equals to e by 2me into me vr mu is equals to e into l by 2me where l is the magnitude of the angular momentum of the electron about the central nucleus vectorially mu is equals to minus e into l by 2me the negative sign indicates the angular momentum of the electron is opposite in the direction to the magnetic moment instead of the electron with the negative charge e if we had taken a particle with charge positive Q, the angular momentum of the magnetic moment would be in the same direction and the ratio mu by L is equals to E divided by 2Me. This ratio is called the gyromagnetic ratio and is a constant. Its value is 8.8 .8 into 10 to the power 10 coulomb per kg for an electron which has been verified by experiments. The fact that even at an atomic level there is a magnetic moment confirms Ampere's bold hypothesis of atomic magnetic moments. This, according to Ampere, would help one to explain the magnetic properties of a material. Can one assign a value to this atomic dipole moment? The answer is yes. 
one can do so within the Bohr's model. Bohr's hypothesized that the angular momentum assumes a discrete set of values namely L is equals to nh by 2 pi. Where n is a natural number, n is equals to 1, 2, 3, etc. And h is a constant named after the max Planck's, that is the Planck's constant, with a value h is equals to 6.626 into 10 to the power minus 34 joule second. This condition of discreteness is called the Bohr's quantization condition. We shall discuss in detail in chapter 12. Our aim here is merely to use it to calculate the elementary dipole moment. Take the value n is equals to 1. We have from equation that mu minimum is equals to eh divided by 4 pi me is equals to 9.27 into 10 to the power minus 24 ampere meter square where the subscript minimum stands for minimum this value is called the Bohr magneton any charge in uniform circular motion would have an associated magnetic moment given by an expression similar to equation 4.34 this dipole moment is labeled as the orbital magnetic moment, hence the subscript L. In mu L, besides the orbital moment, the electron has an intrinsic magnetic moment which has the same numerical value as given in equation 4.37. It is called the spin magnetic moment, but we hasten to add that it is not as though the electron is spinning. The electron is an elementary particle and it does not have an axis to spin around like an atope or our earth nevertheless it does possess an intrinsic magnetic moment this microscopic roots of the magnetism in iron and other materials can be traced back to this intrinsic spin magnetic moment the moving coil galvanometer currents and voltage in circuits have been discussed extensively in chapter 3 but how do we measure them? How do we claim that current in a circuit is 1.5 ampere or the voltage drop across a resistor is 1.2 volt? Figure 4.24 exhibits a very useful instrument for this purpose. That is the moving coil galvanometer. It is a device whose principle can be understood on the basis of the discussion in section 4.10. The galvanometer consists of a coil with many turns, free to rotate about a fixed axis in a uniform radial magnetic field. There is a cylindrical soft iron core which is not makes the field radial but also increases the strength of the magnetic field. When a current flows through the coil, a torque acts on it. The torque is given by tau is equals to NIAB where the symbols have their usual meaning. Since the field is the radial, by design, we have taken sin theta is equals to 1 in the above expression for the torque. The magnetic torque NIAB tends to rotate the coil. A spring SP provides a counter torque K5 that balances the magnetic torque NIAB, resulting in a steady angular deflection phi. In equilibrium, K5 is equals to NIAB where K is the torsional constant of the spring, that is the restoring torque per unit twist. The deflection phi is indicated on the scale by a pointer attached to the spring. We have phi is equals to NAB divided by K into L. The quantity in the brackets is a constant for a given galvanometer. The galvanometer can be used in a number of ways. It can be used as a detector to check if a current is flowing in a circuit. We have come across this usage in the Wheatstone bridge arrangement. In this usage, the neutral position of the pointer when no current is flowing through the galvanometer is in the middle of the scale and not at the left end as shown in the figure. 4.24 depending on the direction of the current the pointer deflection is either to the right or the left the galvanometer cannot as such be used as an ammeter to measure the value of the current in a given circuit this is for two reasons one galvanometer is very sensitive device it gives a full scale deflection for a current in order of mu a 2. For measuring currents, the galvanometer has to be connected in series and 
as it has a large resistance this will change the value of the current in the circuit to overcome these difficulties one attaches a small resistant rs called the shunt resistance in parallel with the galvanometer coil so that most of the current passes through the shunt the resistance of this arrangement is rg into rs divided by rg plus rs is approximately equal to r if rs has a small value in relation to the resistance of the rest of the circuit rg the effect of the introducing the measuring instrument is also small and negligible this arrangement is schematically shown in the figure 4.25 the scale of this ammeter is calibrated and then graduated to read off the current value with ease we define the current sensitivity of the galvanometer as the deflection per unit circuit from equation 4.38 the current sensitivity is phi by i is equals to na b divided by k a convenient way for the manufacturer to increase the sensitivity is to increase the number of turns n we choose galvanometers having sensitivities of value required by our experiment the galvanometer can also be used as a voltmeter to measure the voltage across a given section of the circuit for this it must be connected in parallel with that section of the circuit further it must draw a very small current otherwise the voltage measurement will disturb the original step up by an amount which is very large usually we like to keep the disturbance due to the measuring device below 1% to ensure this a large resistance r is connected in series with galvanometer this arrangement is schematically depicted in figure 4.26 note that the resistance of voltmeter is now rg plus r is approximately equal to r that is large the scale of the voltmeter is calibrated to read off the voltage value with ease We define the voltage sensitivity as deflection per unit voltage. An interesting point to note is that increasing current sensitivity may not necessarily increase the voltage sensitivity. Let us take equation 4.39 which provides a measure of current sensitivity. If n is equals to 2n that is we double the number of turns then phi by i is equals to 2 phi by i. thus the current sensitivity doubles however the resistance of the galvanometer is also likely to double since it is proportional to the length of the wire in equation 4.40 if n converts to 2n and r converts to 2r thus the voltage sensitivity phi by v is equals to phi by v that is it remains unchanged so in general the modification needed for the conversion of galvanometer to ammeter will be different from what is needed from converting it to a voltmeter summary 1 the total force on the charge q moving with velocity v in the presence of magnetic and electric fields b and e respectively are called the lorentz force is given by the equation force is equals to q v cross b plus e the magnetic force q v cross b is normal to v and work done by it is zero two a straight conductor of length l and carrying a steady current i experiences a force f in a uniform external magnetic field b f is equals to i l cross b three In a uniform magnetic field B, a charge Q executes a circular orbit in a plane normal to B. Its frequency of uniform circular motion is called the cyclotron frequency and is given by Vc is equals to Qb by 2 pi m. This frequency is independent of particle's speed and radius. This fact is exploited in a machine, the cyclotron. which is used to accelerate the charged particles 4 the biot severt law asserts that the magnetic field db due to an element dl carrying a steady current i at a point p at a distance r from the current element is db is equals to mu not by 4 pi into i dl cross r divided by r cube 
to obtain the total field at p we must integrate this vector expression over the entire length of the conductor 5 the magnitude of the magnetic field due to a circular coil of the radius r carrying a current i at an axial distance x from its center is b is equals to mu naught i r square divided by 2 into x square plus r square whole to the power 3 by 2. Sixth, ampere circuited law. Let an open surface S be bounded by a loop C. Then the ampere's law states that loop integral B dot DL is equals to mu naught I, where I refers to the current passing through S. The sign of I is determined from the right hand rule. We have discussed a simplified form of this law. If B is directed along the tangent to every point on the perimeter L, of a closed curve and is constant in magnitude along the perimeter, then BL is equals to mu naught IE, where IE is the net current enclosed by the closed circuit. Seventh, the magnitude of the magnetic field at distance R from a long straight wire carrying a current I is given by B is equals to mu naught I divided by 2R. The field lines are the circles concentric with the wire. Eighth, the magnitude of the field B inside a long solenoid carrying a current I is B is equals to mu naught N I, where N is the number of turns per unit length. For a toroid, one obtains B is equals to mu naught N I divided by 2 pi R, where N is the total number of turns and R is the average radius. 9. Parallel current attracts and anti-parallel currents repel. 10. The planar loop carrying a current I having N closely wound turns and an area A possess a magnetic moment M where M is equals to NIA and the direction of M is given by the right hand thumb rule. When this loop is placed in a uniform magnetic field B, the force F on it is zero and the torque on it is tau is equals to m cross b. In a moving coil galvanometer, this torque is balanced by a counter torque due to a spring yielding k phi is equals to n i a b, where phi is the equilibrium deflection and k the torsion constant of the spring. 11. An electron moving around the central nucleus has a magnetic moment mu given by mu is equals to e divided by 2m into l where l is the magnitude of the angular momentum of the circulating electron about the central nucleus the smallest value of mu is called the bohr's magneton bohr's magneton mu b is equals to 9.27 into 10 to the power minus 24 joules by tesla 12 a moving coil galvanometer can be converted into an ammeter by introducing a shunt resistance RS of the small value in parallel. It can be converted into a voltmeter by introducing a resistance of large value in series. Points to ponder. Electrostatic field lines originate at a positive charge and terminates at a negative charge or fade at infinity. Magnetic field lines always form the closed loops. 2. The discussion in this chapter holds only for steady currents, which do not vary with time. When currents vary with time, Newton's third law is valid only if the momentum carried by the electromagnetic field is taken into account. 3. Recall the expression of the Lorentz force, F is equals to Q into V cross B plus E. The velocity-dependent force has occupied the attention of some of the greatest scientific thinkers. One of the switch to the frame with instantaneous velocity v, the magnetic part of the force vanishes. The motion of the charged particle is then explained by arguing that there exists an appropriate electric field in a new frame. We shall not discuss the details of this mechanism. However, we stress that the resolution of the paradox implies that electricity and magnetism are linked phenomena, electromagnetism, and that Lorentz force expression does not imply 
a universal preferred frame of reference in nature. Fourth, Ampere circuit law is not independent of biot severed law. It can be derived from the biot severed law. Its relationship to the biot severed law is similar to the relationship between Gauss law and Coulomb's law.